Where's this back? This is, is this uh, Lighthouse? Which this is, is my car, this is your Okay. Is it it's too far out, maybe, when you're closer? No. Is it it's too far out? No, it was, it was too far out, I put it okay. closer. I just close it and let's start now. Where's the announcements? Ready? You're crossing? Huh? You started? Yeah, Huh? Moshe, this door also. This, this door also. Okay. okay, perfect. Okay, we're going to start in about two minutes. You started? Okay. Here you go. Welcome, guys. Welcome to Lighthouse Project. I want to go over tonight's generous sponsors. Hanna Rappaport in honor of Yehuda Arye ben Chaya Bela Rivka for his birthday. Mario Lichtenstein in honor of Gedalia. Anonymous for the Chatzlach of Adam Abraham ben Osnat. Dan Dizen in honor of his wife Tamar Chaya Bat Racha for their 18th wedding anniversary. Thankful to Hashem and may he be blessed with Bracha, Hatzlacha, and Nacha from his kids. Amen. And thank you to Gedalia. May he also be blessed. Amen. The Mankis family in memory of Shalom David ben Itzhak Kakon Zichonol Bracha. Anonymous in honor of Tamara Bat Malka. Zebulun Bat Malka and Rafael Ben Miriam, and for the Rafua Shlema, Hatzlacha, Parnasan, thanks to Hashem, and finally, in honor of the memory of Devorah Fega Bat Shmuel and Menachem Mendel Ben Elchanan. Thank you Amen. very much. Guys. Amen. Okay, welcome to the Lighthouse. Just a couple events we have to announce. Uh, February 19th, we're going to be in Manhattan, and God willing, in March, uh, middle of March, we're going to be in both Philadelphia and Chicago. So we're going to be posting that on, um, on God willing on WhatsApp. Okay, today's class is going to be a phenomenal class on this concept called Bitul. Bitul means in Hebrew, self-nullification, acceptance. Um, bitul is, a, is what Ram Nachman used to deal with pain. Bitul is, what we're going to get into Bitul is, Bitul is the opposite of addiction. Where addiction is running away from life, Bitul is approaching life. But we're going to actually teach you how to actually use that tool today. It's a phenomenal tool. It's a tool that I've been using pretty much my past 10, 12 years. And it's going to teach you this tool on, on how, to, how to use this when basically you have, you have a person that's completely lost and he doesn't know where to turn to. 
And there's times that we're all going to feel like that. We're all going to feel like this concept of just closing our eyes and becoming into bitul. So let's understand that's the word bitul. It's funny because the word also is, is be a tool. So we can also use, it's a tool. So use bitul as a tool. We need to understand something that we can't try to always understand everything in life. God awards us with one thing, with humility. So let's start with, first, before we get into the class in Bittal, let's talk, talk about ten concepts, eight or nine concepts, before we get into this concept. So you guys so we, will warm up a little bit um, into this. So number one, pain is a catalyst for growth. And growth is non-negotiable. So if anybody, if we're trying to avoid pain in life, that's the problem. Like we said, running away from pain is what's causing more pain. So pain is a catalyst for growth. The only way really I'm going to grow today is through, is through pain. And growth is non-negotiable. So right away I have to accept some kind of pain in my life. Number one. Second thing is we need to understand that our Creator, just like a father, if he would hold the son's hand his whole life, he would ultimately destroy the son. Pretty much. If you held your son's hand and you never gave him space, you would destroy him. He wouldn't know what to do if there's challenges. He wouldn't know what to do if any little thing goes wrong because his, his father's always holding his hand. So the system, the, our creator cannot hold your hand your whole life. People today, uh, where's God? Where, 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 why is this going the wrong way? Why are things like this? Your creator cannot hold your hand your whole life. Just like you couldn't hold your son's hand, you have to let it go. Why do you have to let it go? Because the son has to experience what it is to go through life. And he has to be able to do it himself. So if the system is also made where the person's only wanting somebody to hold his hand the whole, whole life, basically he wants clarity all the time, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not going to happen. So we, we, it's okay, you have to be comfortable today with a little concealment in life. So remember, he hasn't abandoned you. The Father has not abandoned you. He has only concealed himself. Remember that concept. Because if I think my Father abandoned me, that's it. I, I'm, I'm going to call it in. I'm going to fall into despair. But if I know God, my Creator is concealed, it's very easy for me to go into Bittal. What Rabbi Nachman refers to Bittal here, in wisdom, and he says, the Rebbe once told one of his students, he says, when things are very, very bad, the only thing you need to do is make yourself into nothing. When your spouse is screaming at you, when your mother-in-law is screaming at you, when you have so much pain that somebody's yelling at you or something's happening to you where it's beyond your comprehension, where there's no way you can figure it out, it's not the time to think, it's a time to close your eyes and picture that something's good out of this. Okay, what does he say here? I asked him, how do you make yourself into nothing? So Rabbi Nachman's advice is, when things get really bad in life, we have to make ourselves into nothing. How do you do this? He says, you close your mouth, you close your eyes, and you are like nothing. It's like you don't exist. It doesn't mean becoming a nebach, it doesn't mean becoming weak. It means at that moment, what I need to do is close my eyes, and there's a bigger picture happening that I can't see. We're going to talk about the reason why people have pain is because of the God has not God has taken away their their knowledge. Sometimes your Creator will take away your knowledge from you, so you experience something, you go through the pain in order to have something else in your life. It's very Ram Nachman says some, many times that your Creator will take away your dot. You wonder how did I get here? How did I do this? What was I doing when I was younger? Your Creator will actually take away your dot. So he says, sometimes you may feel so overwhelmed by the evil inclination. You are confused, you are disturbed by every evil thoughts that are very difficult to overcome. You have to make yourself like nothing. You no longer exist. Your eyes, your mouth, your are closed. Every thought is banished and your mind ceases to exist. This is how you nullify yourself. You close your eyes like you don't exist. You, that's going to happen to you sometimes. What happens is when people get this amount of pain, they become so overbearing that they either use, they scream, they numb. No. Just make yourself like nothing. This is called Bitul. 
to nullify yourself to a much higher will. We talk about one of the prayers in the recovery community, which I normally don't talk a lot of big things from the big book, but this specific, this specific thing is, I think there, there was some kind of prophecy. Acceptance is the only answer. And acceptance is the answer to all my problems. This isn't a big book. It could be that a person has an addiction just so he can hear this line, this paragraph, which is pretty much why people are suffering today. Acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. When I am disturbed, it is because I find some people, place, or situation, or some fact of my life unacceptable to me. And I can find no serenity until I accept that person, place, thing, or situation as being exactly the way it was supposed to be at the moment. That's acceptance. Not changing your spouse, not changing the situation, not waiting to be married, to be happy, not waiting for this to happen. Accepting every single situation. That's be tool. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake until I accept my addiction. I cannot stay sober unless I accept life on life's term. I cannot be happy. Very deep concept. That means unless you accept life on life's terms at the present moment that you're at right now, you can never be happy. That is really a munah. That is bitul. That is accepting God's will. If we only had one prayer in life, it should be, God, let me accept what you want. Let me accept your will. Let your will be my will. If you only had that prayer, you wouldn't need anything else. But all the problems and all the stress today is coming from, I can't accept this. I can't accept what's going on right now. I can't accept why my friends are more successful than I am. So it leads me to jealousy. I can't accept why I'm not married at 35. I can't accept why this is happening to me. So what happens is, right away, we cut off emunah. We cut off everything, and we don't get anything else. Acceptance is the answer to everything. That's why Rabbi Rush says, he not only acceptance, but say toda, toda, for that, everything. We're going to get to why it's so important. But unless that person comes in and has this mindset, his brain will not work. Because your, your brain will only work on happiness. Our brains do not work on sadness. Our brains do not work on despair. We know that the solutions are out there. They're just not revealed to us. They're concealed. And your job in life is to, ask, is, is to quest for knowledge and, 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 and ask Hashem to, to reveal the, the, the outer should become inner into your, into your life. But remember, until you say, I accept life on life's term, which is very, dif- very difficult for people to do. It requires for them to think greater than they feel. It requires them to be, them to be vulnerable. It requires them to be completely, completely out of their comfort zone. Because when we worry and we get anxious, at least we're saying, listen, at least I'm doing something about it, right? I'm holding on to it. At least I'm worried nothing bad's going to happen. This is the mentality today. As long as I worry about it, something bad's going to happen. Nothing will happen. I can't just let it go like that. What do you mean? Just let it go like that? They can't, people can't do it. They can't do it because they're too stuck on holding on to something. And this is the, one of the number one things we get people. You have to accept life on life's term. This should be taught at every university. This should be taught because you know how many younger kids today are anxious and depressed? When did you see 21-year-olds with, with depression, anxious? Hey, this is a disaster out there. It's a disaster out there. You never saw so much sadness in, 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 in college. Go to college campuses. The, the, the statistics are, are horrifying. How much anxiety and depression? They're not even 20, they're not even married yet. They're not even married yet. You figure they have all the time in the world, they're in the great, you know, millennial world, and they're more anxious and depressed now. What does that tell you about society? What does that tell you about society? Big deal. You have to accept life on life's terms. That's how you get to, that's how you get to second base. Without that, we can't even, we can't even, the class doesn't even exist. We can bitle the class completely. That's what we get addicts to do. That's what we get people in recovery to do. It could be that a person, if he just goes into recovery just to get this concept, it should have been, 
it was worth him going from, to an addiction to get this concept. Let's continue. When we accept, we recognize there's something much, much bigger is happening that my, my mind can't comprehend. That's what acceptance does. Is it allows you to recognize there's a much bigger picture. Whenever we're closing our eyes in this world, what are we closing our eyes to? We're closing our eyes to the light of Hashem, which is the light of Ein Sof, which is the light of infinity. It's infinity, the light. But because of my comprehension, I can't get to that light by myself unless I go through pain, because pain forces me to close my eyes and say, and say there's something bigger going on. That's why, for example, if somebody is going to take your tooth out, you, you don't watch them take your tooth out. You don't watch them, unless you're, you know, unless you're out of your mind. But you don't watch the guy take your tooth out. You close your eyes. Why do people close their eyes when they're getting a shot, when they're getting an injection? Do people close their eyes when any kind of little bit of pain? Close your eyes. Why? Open your eyes. Because when you close your eyes, you're closing your eyes to a much bigger picture in life. And this is very contrary to the world that tells you you have to figure everything out. Or, you, or Freud, you have to figure everything out. Rabbi Nachman says, no. There's times you have to close your eyes. Because the intensity of the night is so strong that you just have to close your eyes and tap into something. We're going to talk about how many people today, if you look at you know, if you look at Mel Robbins, you know, how she came up with the five-second rule. It came when she was completely depressed. She lost her house. She lost, she lost her business. And she was depressed in bed, but she started closing her eyes to something else. Or anybody who's written, or, or it could have been, um, you know, many people who, who, who came out with breakthroughs in their life. But they went through a tremendous amount of darkness. And in that darkness, they created vessels, not by numbing, by closing their eyes to a bigger picture, knowing that something greater is going to happen. Because we need to understand that the whole world was created out of love. God created this world out of love. He didn't create the world to get somebody. But if the person is going in the wrong direction, he's got to remind them. So he has to bring suffering upon the person. Another reason why we have to go through darkness is because darkness triggers a cry from the heart. There's no question when a person has darkness, he prays completely different. He's all in He's not praying with his phone and, and tweeting at the same time. The person's going through pain. The phone's off and he's screaming, God help me. That's really where you're supposed to get to. But today we don't get to that way. We usually get to when we have pain. There's no question. When I, when I was going through things, this, my prayers were, no question they were ten times more concentrated. Because darkness triggers out a cry from the heart. It pierces the ego. Four. Stress weighs a ton. Bitter weighs nothing. You ever had a fight with somebody? You're talking to them, and next thing you know, let's just let it go. It's like you lost 100 pounds. Just let it go. What happens? It's like you, you become a different person. The chest, your chest is, is lightened. You feel completely different. That's what bitter allows you to do. It allows you to close your eyes and just let it go. Right now, it's not focusing on why is this happening, but it's happening for me. Imagine jo Yosef Atzadi. How did he get through all these, his, his problems? How did he get through slavery? How did he get through the test, going through jail? He was in constant bittle because he saw a vision. What did Yosef Atzadi see? He saw already a dream that he would be, they would be bowing down to him. He already saw the prophecy. So what a person has, trust in, 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 in bitachon in Hashem, he has a vision, that person, Hashem gives him vision. So once you see a goal, and you see that goal so clear, everything else does not make a difference. You're so focused on the goal, you're so focused on, 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 on hitting that goal, the obstacles do not make a difference to you. But when a person doesn't have that vision, he panics. When people don't have vision, what do they do? They panic. So trust gives you vision, and once you have vision, you see it clear. You don't need to get... If I have good vision, I don't need to get close to a book and read it. I don't need to see proof for everything. I trust. I don't need to see details. I don't have to. Hashem doesn't have to prove to me anything. But if my vision is weak, I always need answers. I always need answers. I always need questions. What do you need? You need better vision. 
You need better vision. How, well, how do you get better vision? Trust. When you trust, when, when they say a CEO is a visionary, he's a visionary. It doesn't matter if he lost money this quarter. He's not freaking out. Or, he, or it doesn't matter if the economy is down 5%. He's a visionary. He sees way down the line. A good quarterback can see way down the line. But somebody who's very weak-minded and has no belief system, for him he has to get very close to things. And things have to be constantly shown to him. He can't, he can't get to the next level. He can't say, you know what? I don't have to. Today I win or learn. He doesn't have to win every day. Because he knows it's a, it's a process. It's not a prize. So as we said, answers are always there, they're just concealed. We know this many times. How many times have we woken up with new answers? How many times have we gone through situations? The answers are always there, as people usually say. One day we'll celebrate, celebrate this situation. I know it's going to work out, but one day I'll celebrate it. The question is, why, why are we not celebrating now? If you know it's going to, you're going to celebrate it, start celebrating now. That's what Rabbi Ruth says. If you believe the miracle, why don't you start throwing the party? Throw the think, thinking party. People think, how could... You know, there's many stories where he said, where people, their prayers were answered. People prayed a lot. Their prayers were answered already. But they didn't thank God. See the difference? So I always, when I'm going through an obstacle, and I'm going through something, I always, always, always have an anchor of a certain thankful party of a party with, with, that I'm going to throw cheesecake, or I, I'm always anchoring already the Yeshua. I'm always anchoring the, that I know it's going to work out. And this is exactly how, when they say that the Jews, the, the, the Jews were, they, they were saved and the merit of the woman. Why? Because Miriam, she started, she knew the sleeve was going to split. She started, she already brought the drums. She brought them, she already brought the, the, the parade. She already believed in it. That's exactly what we're supposed to do when we're going through pain. Anchor in your mind where you want to go, not what you're going through. If I'm, if I'm focusing too much on what I'm going through, I can't anchor my mind on where I want to go. Every time I have, a, I have an obstacle, I have a situation, I'm already, thinking about the, I'm already thinking about celebrating, God willing, this Thursday, I'm throwing a, a, big, a big breakfast in my synagogue. Another, another, another goal that, that, thank God, it was a, because it, it's focus. You have to right away, you have to label. Whatever God gives you is giving it to you out of love. That's how you label it. The quicker you label something, the quicker you can already create a solution for it. But if I don't have a label on that situation, what's going to be? What's going to happen? What will be with me? Instead of saying, what will be with me, you have to say, what does God want from me? Big difference. One is, what will be with me? talking about the I, Ani, I. What's going to be with me? What does God want from me? You go from I, Ani, to I, Ani. Humility. What does God want from me in this situation? Why is my wife screaming at me? Ego. What does God want from me in this situation? What does He want from me? Does He want me to to not take things personal? Does he want me to be more calm? Does he want me to honor my wife more? It's, it's unbelievable line. You could give yourself one line. You flip the whole... You know, in life, you have to ask better questions. If you ask good questions, you ask empowering questions, you're going to get empowerment answers. Why is this happening to me? What kind of, what kind of answer are you going to get? Because you have no mazal. Because things always happen to you. This is your life. Well, what does God want from me here? Maybe this is not the relationship I should be in. This is why he's doing it for me. You see, it's a, it's, you can magically shift your consciousness right away. As soon as something happens, you label it right away. You go from ani to ayin. You go from, I'm sorry, ayin to, instead of saying ani, me, say, what does Hashem want from me in this situation? It's an unbelievable thing. And when you say that, then you're always going to get the answer. Because you're asking an empowerment question with simcha instead of, because, instead of saying self-pity. Why is this happening to me? This is what mirrors exactly what happened with Yosef HaTzadik. 
you didn't sell me, I was sent here. He says, you sold me here? Victim, I was sent here. Victor. That's really how we get, that's how you really get through obstacles really quicker. Because we spoke about one way to crush negativity is having simcha, is having happiness in, in your problems. It's one way to crush negativity. You crush it. It's an unbelievable concept. But in order to have that mindset, right away when something happens, you have to get out of your head, enter the moment, and label that thing as Hashem's got to be doing it for my benefit. What, do, what, what is my calling here? What is my calling here in that situation? And right away, like we said, you get empower, empowering questions, you get empowering answers. And you can ask that question in your heart. What does God want from me? That's, that's exactly what you should do. Second, six, God has to break your heart to save your soul sometimes. The person, many people, many people, I, I can't, there's not a day that I don't see young girls in my, in my recovery center. Boyfriend broke up with them, bad relationship, they turn to, they turn to, recover, they turn to drugs. That guy's not for you. Yes, Hashem broke your heart. You're in pain. But He saved your soul. But you can't see that at that. You can't see when the pain itself. In that situation, it's very hard to see it when the pain is there. So sometimes you just, a person has to... It, it's time to cl- just close his eyes and know it's all happening for the best. Remember, what is the opposite of closing my eyes? What is the opposite of Bitul? Opposite of Bitul is one, running away from it through addictions, that stops the whole process. That stops the whole process, be told. Because you're saying, God, leave me alone. You're taking, it, when a person's in an addiction, what is he telling God? Leave me alone. I'm not interested in growing. I'm not interested in be told. I'm not interested in that. Just leave me alone. That's what an addiction tells your creator. Get, focus on somebody else. See how bad, see the problem with it? You, you lose Hashem. Because you numb your heart. You, lo- you lose the whole process. You're telling God, leave me alone. I don't want to deal with this. I don't want to deal with this. Guy that smokes after he has a Shalom Bai problem, instead of coming to Hashem and saying, Hashem, help me with my wife. Clearly, I, there's something wrong with my, I'm not Something's wrong with my Shalom Bai. I need to work on it. I, I need to smoke. She's too tough on me. <laughs> that guy will never have Shalom Bai. He'll never have Shalom Bai. Because he, he just took Hashem out of the picture. That's why the addictions are such a problem. Because they, take, they, they stop everything. <laughs> they put the life on pause. They put that great movie on pause. Blaming people is another way to stop the process. Exactly what Adam did. He blamed somebody else. Instead of saying, you know what, I made a mistake. So blaming people stops b You can't go into b and be blaming people. Three, venting it out, screaming, yelling. These things, these are normal ways people deal with pain. They either suppress it, they vent it, or they numb it. These processes do not allow the bitul process to happen. And then in the bitul process, as we're going to see, is where you get this new light of why you went through that situation, why you went through that situation. For example, my case, obviously the trauma six, seven years ago with four or five things happening at the same time. The only way I got here is through, through acceptance, through bitul, and through having faith. And, and Hashem showed me exactly why I had to go through it. Now I see it clear. If you tell me, why, why, did you, why were you so upset back then if you had to go through it? So another principle in, in, in anything in life is once you find meaning, suffering goes away. This is a very Viktor Frankl concept. Our job in life is to find meaning in life. When I find meaning in life, when I search for meaning, then suffering goes away. Suffering goes away. When I don't find meaning, then I'm left with what? I'm left with chaos. I'm left with uncertainty. So my job in life is to search for meaning. And to search for meaning. And searching for meaning requires prayers Humility, be tool, all of these things is how you end up getting what you get. So it's a process. 
Let's talk about the concept of Bitur. Before we get to that, we're going to just take a small tour from Lesson 61. You could see another issue that people have is, is time itself. Right? They're thinking, how long is this going to take? How much longer am I going to be single? How much longer am I going to wait for this deal to happen? How much longer? You see, you see time becomes an enemy to many people. Time works against them. Time freaks them out. Rav Nachman says there's something very beautiful in Lesson 61. He says God is beyond time. This is the matter of truth, very amazing and mysterious. It is impossible for the human mind to comprehend it. God is beyond time. But no, time exists, stems from nothing more but our deficient comprehension because our intellect is very limited. The greater the intellect, the more time contracts and is nullified. Typical example of this is you take your kids to Orlando. You're an adult. Three hours, big deal. What's three hours? Tell your five-year-old kid it's going to take you three hours to get there. Three hours? It's forever. A three-year-old, you tell a kid three hours for a three-year-old, he's going to go, go crazy. Because it, for him, time, three hours, is, is, is because he has very small intellect. Right? You tell your grandfather three hours, he'll laugh at you. Because his intellect is, is, is greater. So also, we, today, when a person's freaking out, it's because of his mind. He's giving a certain label that something's going to take a long time. Because of his comprehension. So all of a sudden, a person can go on a date or go on a business deal. This deal is going to take forever. It's going to take forever. So for that person, time becomes an enemy. Or you see this every day in recovery. How long am I going to have to be here? How long am I going to... It's like people don't want to wait on line in life. So what do they do? They skip the line. And then what do they do again? They go back to the beginning of the line. And then they go back a little bit more. They get a little, a little process. I can't deal with time anymore. So they do. Skip the line again. And it becomes over and over and over again. Like New Yorkers say. Hurry up and wait. Speed up to the light and wait. It's a process. Whatever you're going through, it's a process. Time should not become your enemy. For example, if you're having a very good Hizbodidut, an hour will go by whew, in a minute. You'll be like, where was I? But tell somebody who doesn't know what to talk about to talk to God for an hour, he'll rather sh jump off a building. Because for him, his comprehension of time is, is an hour is, is crazy. But it's unbelievable spiritually how this is an issue. But if, if there's no problem. I've never seen a guy say, you know what? I can't be in a movie for three hours. I can't be in a heat game for three hours. It's so long, this heat game. Somehow, over time, for nothing. You see, for the Yitzhahara, there's no problem with time. Tell the guy to go pray 15 minutes, meditate. 15 minutes? What am I going to do? But he has no problem sitting at the heat game for three hours, and he won't blink an eye. And time will go by quickly. Because anything with, the, with, with entertainment, there's no Yetzirah, by the way. They'll let you do what you want. But how come in spirituality, all we want to do is get rid of it, get, be done with it? Don't you recognize the problem? All in spirituality, all people want to do because of our intellect, all we want to do is just get over with it. And yet this is what's causing the spiritual chef of the Tecums. So I remember starting his bodhidu. Ten minutes was, was, was like pulling teeth. Because I'm, at that time I had nothing to say. My intellect was very, was very narrow. So time became, what, I, I, I gotta go, I gotta go. I was always in the next moment. Until I started really tasting what a good prayer his bodhidu, that you're so in the zone that you don't even know what time is. So today, the more spiritual you are, the more time will work for you. The less spiritual you are, the more time will be against you. For example, you go on a date. When is he going to come in? When is he going to get married? You're not even in... Get to know him. Get to know him. Be in the moment. But all of a sudden, because we're not in the moment, then time becomes an enemy for us. 
So we can't go into Bittal because of the pain of time. And God is beyond time. And God is beyond time. So you ever say, time flies when you're having fun? Time flies when you're doing the right thing. When you're doing the right thing, when you're helping people, time flies. But when you're not doing the right thing, and you're in the wrong place, time becomes very, 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 becomes the enemy. And time pressures you. So we have to recognize, do I, I want to get beyond time? I want to get where I nullify time? I have to become more spiritual. I have to be more in touch with my soul, and then time will fly by. A person could be on a date, he loves the date, they're having a great date, four hours, five hours, is gone. My first date with my wife was six hours, I don't even know what happened. But if you're on, I've been on other dates before. I was ten minutes, I was, Ugh. you're dying in ten minutes. Well, why is 10 minutes and 6 hours? You were, the, with, you were with the wrong person. With the wrong person. So you know time could work against you. And, but if you're having fun while you're doing, if you're in the process in life and you're just in the moment, you'll see time will, will work for you. But if you're not in the moment and you're anxious about what's going to be, what's going to happen with this, what's going to happen with that, then time will work against you. Because what does the evil inclination always say? The next moment is better than this moment. And then the next moment is better than this moment. You always have a better moment to be in. That's the trap of the evil inclination of life. They'll tell you the next moment. We see it all the time in our, in our facility. But once they click and they hit that spiritual button, wow, I'm, so, I'm enjoying my recovery. Thank God I'm here. And time doesn't bother them anymore. But until they hit that sweet spot, when is this over? When am I leaving? Like a little kid leaving. And you see it so much. When a person hits that sweet spot in life, Time will work for him. It will not work against him. good indication is if you enjoy reading a book, if you enjoy a class and you're in the moment, that means you're, you're, in, you're, you're doing the right thing. But if you're already doing something else while you, do, uh, while you can't even get the moment, then you recognize time will always become a burden to you. You're going to date the guy who's on his phone. This is, it's always the next moment. It's always the next moment. The next moment's better. This moment's not good enough. Even you see people, six people at the table, eating, let's take a picture. That moment's not enough. They need another moment. They always need another moment, people. But the key is to be in the moment. That's really the key. So lesson 65, which talks about Bito. First, Rabbi Nachman begins the story saying that God created the world out of absolute love. And he has to recognize that any trouble or suffering that a person goes through is because... He's not focused on the ultimate purpose in his life. This guy is in the wrong, he's on the wrong lane. He's going through what he's not supposed to. He's in the wrong, he's in the wrong life that he's in. He's married to the wrong person. He, he completely went on another world. So what happens is your higher soul is like your GPS. That even if you take the batteries out of the GPS, people say, you know, sometimes a little inner voice is speaking to them. They take the batteries out. They don't want to hear it. So what happens Hashem has to create a midlife crisis in your life. Or He has to create pain. Or He has to create suffering in a person's life. But actually, these are very, these, this is actually great. Certainly, God intentionally sends all suffering for His benefit, whether to remind Him to repent or to cleanse Him. Always the beginning of being a Baal Shuvah, or in the beginning of getting closer to God, there's always going to be, okay, you ready to come? Okay, let's see if you're really into it for it. We know we have some converts, they convert for capital. Other people convert for Hashem. So when things get a little rough, they're very quickly not to go anymore. So there's a reason why the conversion process has to be three years, or two, three years. Because if you're not going to be resilient now, things are going to go not your way. What happens? You're going to get out. <laughs> why do you think the rabbis make people go through such a lengthy thing? Because what, when it's good, you're good, but when it's not, it's not. The same thing. Why do we have such difficulties when we want to start getting closer to spirituality? It's because the beginning is a test to see if you're really into it or you're just in it for the motivation. So what happens, that process requires a lot of suffering and it requires a lot of cleansing. A lot of cleansing. But ultimately it's for the, part, for the real good because God really wants to prepare you for something great but unless He, he cleanses you, He cannot give you what you want. So Rabbi Nachman says here, in truth, there is no evil whatsoever in the world. Everything is only good. The pain a person nonetheless experiences 
is because of his suffering, God forbid, is only because his awareness has been taken away from him. God took away your awareness. You know, you, he gives you your awareness, all of a sudden, wow, I had to go through this. I'm so happy I had to go through this. But at that moment, when you're going through the pain, he took the awareness away from you. It is then that he feels the pain of the, of the torment and suffering. For then he possesses the awareness. When he possesses it and he sees the awareness, he doesn't feel, feel the pain anymore. For example, you tell a guy, listen, you know, you tell a guy he's got a broken arm and he's in tremendous amount of pain. Tremendous amount of pain. And you tell him, listen, you're going to have to go through surgeries and five surgeries. This guy's closing his eyes and he's in such pain. But next thing you tell him, listen, you're the only survivor in a, in a five-car tra- car accident. All of a sudden, that pain is no longer there. Pain's gone. Why? Because he recognized that pain, that suffering compared to his life, is not really that much pain. Somehow that pain just goes away. Because he's thinking, oh my God, I was just saved. He just got awareness that that's not, a big, that's not such a big deal compared to being the only survivor in a car crash. So you could see how you could manipulate your mind to say, this is only for the good. This is only for the good. It has to be good. That's what you have to say. When something happens to you, you, ha- you have to say, it's always for the good. And this is what he's saying here. That's why when it, it's normal for a person to look at something that's very, very far away, what is the first thing he does? He squints down. He squints down. Because why is he squinting down? To narrow his vision. He's to narrow his vision. And this is what happens when a, person, he, when a person sees something very far away, he can't see it. He can't see it, so he has to close his eyes. And he has to close his eyes because he's trying to get to a much, much deeper meaning. And Rabbi Nachman says here that the moment of self, self-transcendence is a state where one completely becomes absorbed to the ultimate goal. So practically, how do we talk about this practically? You're in pain. All of a sudden... How do I get to the reason why I'm going through that? Like we said before, any other thing, like addictions, like aggressions, like blaming, never gives you the answer. <coughs> Only when you say, I accept this is for, for the best. You close your eyes. Bitul means to nullify yourself. That means that there's times where you just have to disappear. From the, disappear from the moment. And that at some times. Because the pain becomes so bearing. Once you disappear and you nullify, you know what happens? You start closing your eyes to a much, much bigger light. Now what happens? Obviously, you can't stay in that mode forever. Right? Just like the guy cannot close his eyes the whole time in the surgery. So he has to, all of a sudden, what happens? After he closes his eyes, he has to all of a sudden open his eyes again. Now, when he opens his eyes, because he tried to escape that situation, anytime, let's say, we're going through a problem, we're trying to escape the situation, we're closing our eyes to know that everything's good, it's to cleanse us, or then what happens right after that experience, you're going to get hit ten times worse than originally from closing your eyes. Because you're, the battle now becomes, the Yetzirah knows that you're trying to escape and find the ultimate good in that situation. And you're closing your eyes to a point where everything is good. But what happens, the intellect is saying, what are you talking about? You're out of your mind. Look at the bills you've got to pay. Look, at, look, at, look, you're still not married. The intellect is telling you, the Yetzirah is telling you, get back to reality. You can't go into Bittal. What do you mean you're going to close your eyes and escape to a bigger picture? No, you have to worry about it. You have to be upset. You have to be depressed. That's the battle. That's the battle between... The soul and the intellect. When God, let's say, a person wants to forgive somebody, and all of a sudden you get inspired to forgive that person. And you know what? I'm going to forgive this guy after 10 years, even though he doesn't deserve it. And next thing you know, you're about to do it, the Yetzirah says, now you're going to look like a, like a weakling. Look at all, now you're going to look like a nebuch for forgiving him. He's going to think you're weak. I'm not doing it. No, but I have to do it. Then he's going to... T- that battle which Rabbi Nachman says is running and returning between doing the right thing and the Yetzirah. I want to do it? No, I get the You, ever, you want to do something, the next thing you know, the Yetzirah knocks you off? It's because he sees you're going into Bittu. He sees you're doing the right thing. 
He sees you're connecting to the bigger picture. So the evil inclination is going to attack you. And he gives the example here of two wrestlers. Two wrestlers fighting each other. When one gets the upper hand, the other one moves. The mind war is in your head. The mind war. Imagine a person saying, I'm going to accept what life has given me and I'm going to be besimcha. And then the Yetzirah is going to say, how could you be besimcha? What do you have to be thankful for? This is where people completely get knocked out. Because they're trying to be in the bitul. They're trying to accept it. They're trying to do the right thing. But they don't understand that as soon as they try it, the Yetzirah sees now that this guy is really going to get to the focus. So now you get attacked even ten times worse. It's supposed to happen. And then you have to say, no, I'm going to do it. The, 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 the second time or the third time that you continue fighting the negativity, that means if you want to do something good, and all of a sudden you find a way that you have negativity coming to you, you should know exactly that it's meant to happen to you. That means you're going in the right direction. That means you're going in the right direction. People get confused because what happens, they try something, and next thing you know they get attacked. And what happens, they say, no, I tried it, you see it doesn't work. It's exactly what's supposed to happen. It's like the minute you're trying to leave the place, the alarm goes off. Exactly what's supposed to happen. And your job is to continue fighting that B-tool. Closing your eyes. No, my brain says it's not good. But remember, the pain is only coming from the intellect. It's not coming from the soul. The soul knows the place where it's got to go. The soul knows exactly where you have to be. The soul knows you have to go through this trauma. The soul knows you have to go through this addiction. The soul knows you have to lose this money. The soul knows you have to go through this. But the, e, the, 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 the intellect is saying, no, you can't do it. Fight it. That's the battle today. And this is why we're saying here. That, that through the process that you go through this self-transcendence phase, you know what God does? He starts sending you hints. That means the amount of time that I spend saying I'm going to accept it by closing my eyes, I start closing my eyes to a much bigger picture, to, to a light of Ein Sof. And once I come down from that experience, you get a concept called a Rishimut. What is a Rishimut? An imprint from that high experience. What does this mean practically in English? That you're going to all of a sudden, when you go through such pain, God's going to give you a new meaning why you had to go through that. You're going to get meaning in your life. You're going to get a new mindset. Do you ever see people after they go through a trauma? They become resilient people. They become strong people. They have a different mindset. They become a different person. That process of becoming a different person can only have happened by going through this process of fighting the bitul versus reality. I know this is good for me. No, it's not good for you. I know this is good for me. I know it's not good for you. That process is like two, pers- two people fighting. But the amount of time that you spend in Bitul, the time you spend closing your eyes and accepting it, is how God is going to give you all of a sudden the new mindset, the new, the new Rishimut, the new imprint of that experience. So it's normal for a person to start listening to classes. Next thing you know, he wants to ha- start having a Muna. And he wants to start good and positive. And next thing you know, he gets this rash attack. He gets completely dismotivated. He loses all his motivation and he thought that he's going backwards. It's not true. You're actually going forwards. But now what happens is, is now you have an opponent that does not want you to accept things in life. That does not want you to forgive that person. Does not want you to, 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 to let go of that boyfriend that you did, we weren't supposed to date. All of these situations are for the one purpose of a person letting go. Let it go. Accept it. Life on life's terms. Once I accept life on life's terms, the tool starts happening, my new mindset starts happening, new doors start opening. Until then, the doors are still closed. Remember, you have to close the door in order for another door to come open. But that door has to close. And the only way to close that door is through B2, is through, is through escaping, to, a, to knowing that this is happening for a reason. And I'm just going to close the door and accept it. But you lost the money! I'm still going to accept it. Then things start moving for the person. 
That's what we try to get people to do, to start making moves, to start going into bittul, to start finding meaning. Because once you find meaning, Rabbi Nachman says, then you're going to start getting this new insight, this new light from this experience that you went through. How do you know if you went through an experience the right way, Rabbi Nachman say? What's the number one indicator? He's saying, if you can tell a lesson from it. If you can say, I went through this and it made me better. I went through this, I got spirituality from this. I went through this and I became that. I went through this addiction and I became an addictions counselor. That pain that you went through is because you handled it the right way and you got a new... I, obviously, I went through the right way because I wouldn't be teaching classes today. That all came... All the light that I got today came from fighting the darkness back then. Every single light that I got today, I was preparing my vessel for all the light that I got today. And it was a lot of darkness. A lot. Two years of darkness. Two years. Fighting, fighting, fighting. Where it's normal. A person needs to understand. Any human being in 2020, it's normal to, to want to seek to escape and become an addict. It's not an abnormal thing. It's normal with the amount of pressures that they're going through, people are going through. That to want to escape life. To food, or to substances, or to su other things. It's not a, I don't consider people abnormal to want to escape. There's times that I want to escape. But I'm escaping in Bitul. I'm escaping to a much higher light that I don't recognize, that I know this, it's happening to my best. Other people are escaping to nowhere land. You have to escape somewhere. You have to escape in Bitul. And we'll end with this last thing from Rabbi Nachman. Because remember, the highest level of knowledge that you have is knowing that you don't know anything. That's the highest level. The highest level, the more you recognize you know, the more knowledge you have in life, the more you recognize you know absolutely nothing in life. The more you recognize that, oh my God, I never saw it that way. Yeah, of course you didn't see it that way. <laughs> Why? Because your intellect was telling you it was bad. You were giving the wrong meaning because you said you thought you knew. Of course you didn't see it that way, because like I said, like Rav Nachman's telling you, Hashem takes away your awareness. He takes away your awareness on purpose, because He wants you to humble your, yourself, or He wants you to go through that experience. Well, you think people got through Rav Nachman's teachings through a, through a VIP ticket? They got it from brokenness. Being broken, and knowing, and, and, and being in despair, and, knowing, and reading Torah where they, that it didn't, they didn't cling to that. Until they got to such a broken heart that they yelled out to God and says, I need help. Okay, you need help? Let me introduce you to Rabbi Nachman's teachings. Rabbi Nachman, nobody got to Rabbi Nachman's teachings through the front door of the VIP table. They got it through trauma, brokenness, failures, poverty. I mean, because this amount of light that we get from Rabbi Nachman's teachings can never come to a person if he doesn't have a broken heart. So you should know, if you're connected to Rabbi Nachman's teachings, you have a broken heart. That means you're closer to God. Because it says God loves a person with a broken heart. Other people say, what is this? I learned Gemara all day long. What do I need Rabbi Nachman for? There's nothing wrong with me. Like we said, a person who has a broken heart, there's nothing greater than a broken heart, and there's nothing worse than a person who thinks he's got everything. That person is really broken. So Rabbi Nachman ends this Torah like this. And he's telling you, if the whole purpose, if you're telling me that suffering is absolutely very good, and it's cleansing me or bringing me closer to God or, or etc., then why do I have to pray for it to relieve it? Why should I have to pray to relieve it? He says, because you still have to make the vessel. God puts everything in our hands so that we should be the ones to make the vessels of divine love and blessings. A vessel is contained to hold something to make the vessel for that new light that's gonna, that you're going to get. As Kabbalistic teaches that with the, the prayers, Torah, learning, that, these are all ways a person makes a vessel. Because what happens is, the vessels for receiving God kindness are prepared like this. Therefore, before a person prays, everything that comes to him, even suffering, is, is very for good. This is actually great love. And what he's saying here is in order to prepare the vessels, first stage is to lift our eyes up to the ultimate goal. That means anytime we pray 
anytime we're going through pain, the first step, like we do in Rosh Hashanah, what do we do on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, the first two days? We're not asking for anything. We're just saying God is the king. Nothing. That's it. The whole point of Rosh Hashanah is to say God is the king. Crowning the king. Because if I don't crown the king, what am I going to... I can't forget. I can't ask for forgiveness. I can't ask for anything. The first step is crowning the king. The same thing. In order to prepare vessels, we have to crown the king and say it's all one. Let me not think that it's my mother-in-law or the business partner or this. These are just people. I'm focusing on oneness. I'm focusing on oneness. It's all one. He says, in order to prepare the vessels, the first stage is to lift our eyes to the ultimate goal, where everything is good, and to make unity of our prayers. It is only then, it is only by surrendering ourselves in Bitul, knowing and believing that everything is good, then we can actually pray for the things. The reason is because the vessel which we receive these things are actually formed from the trace. Remember this. The vessels that you get, that's going to give you the light that you're going to get, are actually formed from the experience of the bitul experience that you got, went through. The amount, of, literally talking, the amount of pain that you went through in that experience and the amount of time you fought darkness and the amount of time that you didn't use and you didn't uh, seek an escape and you really worked and you continued and continued, that's the amount of the vessel that you get from the experience that you went through and that's the amount of light that you'll get. So now you got to say, wow, I never thought about pain this way. I have to start loving pain. I have to start embracing pain. Because the more I go through this experience without escaping, is the bigger the light that I get from that experience. So I already, like we said many times, you're already in pain. You're crying anyway. Get a reward for it. You're already in pain. Cry to get better. Cry to make bigger vessels instead of crying to quit. That's the difference. So Meshem, help us. So we should all practically know how to go into Bittal. And this is, this is, if everybody wants to buy this book, it's called The Garden of the Souls, Rabbi Nachman on Suffering. It's a phenomenal book by my rabbi, Rabbi Kramer. And he takes Lesson 65, and he takes other Torahs in it. And he, and he basically is telling us that if we start recycling the pain, and we start saying thank you, and, start, and, start, a, and start accepting, we start making vessels. And after the vessel's made... Hashem automatically has to light it. But if there is no vessel made because I don't want to deal with the pain, or I'm complaining about the pain, or I'm numbing the pain, then I can't make a vessel, then I'm not making any vessels. How could any light come to me? So may Hashem help us that we should all make big, big, big vessels. Amen. Anytime, anytime. Anytime. Hope you guys enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. Right, brother. See you tomorrow. Right. What's up? What's going on?